It's like, I just need to talk. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for being patient uh, and uh, for inviting me here to MIT to give this talk about uh, fundamental limits on the Lightning Network protocol. Very excited to do this. Um, but before we jump into this, I have to do um, a little disclaimer. Uh, this is work in progress and the paper is not written yet. So um, what you should do is you should treat some of the numbers with a grain of salt and a bit of caution uh, as they are rough estimates and it's more about the um, methodology and principal way to, to look at these things. And the other problem um, with research is, and, and you're gonna witness this, is um, the main result that I was about to present I discovered, let's say, about three or four months ago, and I shared it with some of my peers, and they acknowledged it, and everybody was happy. And while preparing the slides, I found uh, a tiny flaw in the argument. So the results will be not as strong and surprising as, as I thought they would be. Um, but nevertheless, I think it might be interesting to, to look at um, uh, the thoughts uh, that led to this research. Um, and of course, some of the uh, shortcomings that we discuss can always be fixed by a protocol changes or different behavior by nodes. And in general, I think um, Bitcoin often is being um, very much hyped and we should also think about um, the shortcomings and actively discuss them because um, only if we are aware of them and if we think that we can tackle them, uh, I think we have a strong technology. So what I have learned over the, uh, over the last five years is creating peer-to-peer -peer cache is really, really, really hard. There's a lot of things that can go wrong and a lot of things that are very tricky. I think uh, Clara before gave us uh, some of the examples of channel jamming. Um, yeah. So if we go back to the announcement of Satoshi's paper on the uh, mailing list, um, um, the first reply by James Donald was basically saying, hey, we very much need such a system, um, but the way how I understand your proposal, it does not seem to scale to the required size. And if you go down a little bit further in the, um, uh, the, the last paragraph, he basically states and says, in order to detect a double spending, every participant of the network would have to be aware of all the transaction history in order to see if a coin has already been spent or not. And if we use this, let's say on a global scale, this would be quite some data bandwidth, right? So by the end of the day, this all boils down to block size wars and, and these kinds of discussions. But the argument is actually much more fundamental. It's actually a bandwidth problem. And it's, it's um, really one of the limits that are inside of Bitcoin and if, if you listen to people who were working in decentralized systems back in the days, they looked at Bitcoin and had a similar opinion as this guy and basically said, yeah, it's a neat idea, but we, we don't really have to go through this. And we're actually, I would argue somewhat naive people who were like, oh yeah, I have a good understanding of computer science and uh, this seems convincing, let's give it a try. And then they started bootstrapping the network and it, well, <laughs> I mean, it's still running in some sense, but I mean, of course we know there are problems and one way how we try to resolve these problems is um, by creating the Lightning Network to increase the payment throughput of the network. So the question that I'm asking myself more and more these days is, does the Lightning Network actually fix Bitcoin's shortcoming to work as a peer-to-peer -peer cash system? And um, what you can do is you can just open social media and you find, for example, this nice tweet from about uh, one and a half years ago by, at that time, the CSO of Blockstream, who was uh, sharing a, a video and saying, um, Lightning Network is awesome, it does 40 million transactions per second. And I mean, he also gives the reasoning of uh, his thought by basically saying, yeah, somewhere I read that the channel can do 500 transactions per second and we have 80,000 channels. So if you multiply these two numbers, then you have 40 million channels per second. And you can see the video was uh, watched about uh, like almost a million times. And uh, he, he created quite some fuss. And uh, in another tweet, he was bragging about uh, mainstream media picked this up and this is great. Um, but of course, this could be an outlier. So one year later, you find this article in Bitcoin magazine where the author claims a data-driven exploration proving that Lightning scales Bitcoin payments beyond Visa and the second layer innovation is the way. And, you know, I'm not only a researcher but a mathematician by training, so I fell for the clickbait and thought, well, show me the proof. 
So if you scroll down this article a little bit further down, you see uh, the numbers are promising. It takes each lightning node uh, to be capable of doing just four payments a second in order to beat current payment networks by at least two times. So what this guy did is he basically said, we have 4,000 active nodes on the network, and if every node can route four payments per second, then we can do 16,000 payments per second. And Visa does 8,000, so it's twice as good as Visa. <laughs> and um, since that was the second of many encounters I had, uh, I had this moment that many of you probably already had felt in your life. Uh, duty called, somebody <laughs> must be wrong on the internet, and uh, I really had to prove this. Um, so, yeah, that's the motivation for today's talk. Um, so, some thoughts and roadmap for the talk. First of all, I would argue that network throughput is most certainly not being characterized by looking at the node throughput and multiplied with the number of nodes or with channel throughput and multiplied with the number of channels. Um, people here at MIT probably know this very well. Um, so, I started asking myself, well, what are the features that limit the network throughput by the end of the day. Well, so, I mean, of course we can look at a channel, which I still think is interesting to look at, and then we can ask ourselves, does this somehow translate to the limits that a node has on the network? And, of course, if we know these two things, right, which were basically some part of the prior arguments, how does this actually translate to the limits of the entire network? Um, okay, so let's start with a payment channel and, and look at the limits that we have there. Um, I would argue that the biggest, uh, that there are basically three things that limit uh, what a channel can handle. It's liquidity, the communication bandwidth, and computation bandwidth. And I would argue liquidity is probably the most significant and, and biggest issue. Um, Channels become unreliable if they don't have enough liquidity to forward it or if they have become jammed. Uh, last year I have published an article um, where I introduced the concept of control valves, where you can basically do flow control on your channel. Um, but even if you set up control valves in the most optimal way, you still have a certain failure rate that you expect to see on channels. Um, uh, this might be solvable by the end of the day with um, rebalancing, but this means that we have to stuff transactions on-chain, and it's, it's all very complicated, so you can read some of the arguments in this article. I will not talk about this because what, what I thought is I actually provide a simpler argument to find like an upper bound, and, and so, so what I present today is basically the best case, but liquidity makes things even worse. Um, as just mentioned, you can do on-chain swaps. Uh, we're going to have a nice presentation by Peter later this day who will talk about peer swap, um, where we see how, how these things can help. But I mean, also doing peer swaps is obviously limited by block space, right? So there are other limitations. Um, and, and I would argue, and that's why I'm not talking about this because this is um, ongoing research, this basically boils down to a lot of mathematical optimization problems, and I haven't seen good solutions to them yet, uh, or at least convincing solutions to them yet. So, so I would say the broader ecosystem hasn't understood these problems well enough, or at least for me to a satisfying level. Um, but what I can, can do at this point is I can recommend the master thesis of Sebastian Al uh, Alcher. Um, there is a Medium link that you can find, and he has written about the price of anarchy on the Lightning Network, where he basically studied a lot of the liquidity-based limitations that come on the Lightning Network via game theory. It's um, very readable, and um, if, you, if you're interested in liquidity as an issue, uh, this would be a good starting point. Um, communication bandwidth of a Lightning channel. Um, given the other two things that we have, I would argue for now this is not the biggest bottleneck. I mean, um, Lightning messages are usually pretty small. They can be batched, and uh, internet connection speeds are high. We can stream Netflix videos, so this is probably not a problem. Just keep in mind, um, for all the people who create mobile clients and mobile wallets, they will obviously argue a lot that uh, mobile bandwidth is a limitation, but uh, I will ignore this for the moment. So I will focus on computational bandwidth. Um, that's what this presentation is about. Okay, so in order to understand the computational um, constraints of a lightning channel, let's start um, with the channel state machine of a channel that is 140,000 Satoshis. Um, sorry for the 
weird size, but that's for some other reasons the example that we used in the book Mastering the Lightning Network, and I thought since we already have the diagrams, I could reuse them in the presentation. So we have this channel between Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob both have 70,000 Satoshis in this channel, and this is encoded by Alice having her commitment transaction of the channel, and Bob has his commitment transaction in the channel. So let's assume Alice wants to pay Bob an amount of Satoshis, what she does is she sends an update at HTLC message over the wire and Bob creates a new commitment transaction where Bob takes some of the liquidity that is going to be sent to Alice in the case where the channel resolves and creates an HTLC output for this. Since commitment transaction spent a multi-sig output, Bob cannot fully sign this transaction yet. Bob can only produce his signature. So he needs um, a signature from Alice, which Alice happily will send to Bob by a commitment signed message. So once Bob has received this, the commitment transaction is going to be signed. Bob is happy, he can move forward the state. And um, in, in order to help Alice, what Bob will do is, he will basically revoke his old state by sharing a revocation secret with Alice and uh, basically acknowledging, hey, I received your signature, it's fine, um, please move forward. And what Bob also does is to complete the handshake, Bob will um, send a signature that Alice needs to move forward her state, she will invalidate everything, and uh, with this handshake, the channel state has moved forward. Okay, so far so good. Looks pretty simple. As I said, communication-wise, it's a few round trips on the internet, but it's not too bad. Only problem is, if you look at the details, the commitment signed message is what we're going to look at. So the commitment signed message sends over four fields of data. The first one is the channel ID. So basically, Alice notifies Bob and says, look, in this channel, we're going to do something. Um, and here's the signature for the multisig. Okay, great. <laughs> but then the third and the fourth field become a little bit tricky because the third field is the number of HTLCs that are in a channel. If you were in the talk before uh, from Clara, she already told us that channels can have up to 483 HTLCs, which means there could be a number like 483 in there. And then if you look at the fourth field, um, there will be 483 signatures that Alice sends over to Bob because every HTLC output in the case of resolvement goes to a different multisig, so you need different signatures. So this is quite some signature overhead. And uh, if you paid close attention in, in high school, uh, you have learned about the German mathematician Gauss, uh, who explained us that summing up all numbers from one to n actually grows quadratically. So if you want to concurrently add 483 HTLCs, well, you need a quadratic amount of uh, signature computations. So the question is, is this a problem, yes or no? So um, what I did a couple of years ago is I asked on Stack Exchange, how many transactions can we actually currently verify in Bitcoin uh, on commodity hardware? And I was referred to this blog article by Jameson Lopp, um, and the TLDR is basically 30,000 uh, transactions can be verified per second. So if I assume that a transaction has only one signature, which is kind of like a strong assumption, and that verification speed is the same as signing speed, which from math perspective seems reasonable. Um, a node on pretty strong hardware can do 30,000 uh, signature computations per second. Well, if you assume that uh, signature demand grows quadratic with the number of HTLCs, what this means is you can do 174 concurrent HTLCs in a channel um, if you calculate this backwards. And that is what we basically learn from the protocol. So, so again, I mean, the protocol could probably have a different mechanism of how we transport these HTLCs. I know, for example, Core Lightning is optimizing this a little bit by um, batching uh, signatures, right? So, for example, in this uh, commitment signed and revoke and egg handshake, you don't have to do it for every HTLC that you're adding, but you can basically wait a few milliseconds and see if there were several HTLCs offered, and then you can sign them all in just one message. But of course, this adds latency to the routing process, and since we want to have lightning to be really fast, I mean, it's already in the name like lightning, um, we kind of don't want to introduce this latency, so there's a certain trade-off that is um, encoded inside the protocol. Of course, there could be other mechanisms how we do that stuff. Um, Okay, so if we talked about HTLCs, what does this mean for payments in a remote channel? So the median round trip time that you can measure on the network is roughly two seconds for payments. 
and HTLCs um, can fail towards the beginning of the onion or towards the end of the onion, so they fail somewhere in the middle, which basically means we can assume that one payment attempt on the Lightning Network, on average, logs an HTLC, a remote HTLC, for about one second. Um, I hope this goes along with quick spam, which is like within the 10 second band, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, so if the channel can, can support 174 uh, payment attempts per second, what this means uh, is, remember, not all payments are successful. Um, Christian Decker, at some point in time, has measured 50% uh, of payments are successful on the first attempt. So um, we have roughly 87 or, let's say, 100 payments uh, per second per channel that we can support on the protocol. Um, and the benchmark of Christian Decker, I've also provided the link for you. And uh, by the way, um, Joost Jager, who worked for Lightning Labs, did a benchmark for bottle pay. I don't remember the exact numbers that he produced, but he pretty much came to the same numbers that I have derived theoretically. And I would argue what he basically measured in his benchmark was this quadratic growth of HTLC um, signature computation. Because when, when, when he basically increased the uh, throughput, what he, what he did, he basically introduced batching of, of signature computation. Okay, so this is what's happening on a channel. So the question is, how does this translate to a node? I mean, a node should be fairly easy if you think about it, because as we just discussed, a node uh, can do like 30,000 signatures per second. Um, but I will, I will just start by assuming the following. Um, all the routing requests on a node are distributed equally across all channels. And of course, this is a very strong assumption. But on the other hand, it's kind of reasonable because a node can do buffering or load balancing, or it could just fail payments if they just receive too many HTLCs on a certain channel. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, for now we can work on this assumption. So if the number of signatures a node can handle is fixed at 30,000 signatures per second, then we have the following observation. We take the 30,000 signatures that we have available per second, divide them by our node degree. So this means these are the signatures we have per channel. Again, we take the square root of this, and then we multiply this by the node degree, and this gives us the transactions per second that we can actually get through a node. And this is where I kind of like oversimplified initially the argument, because if you plot this, is ac it actually looks quite promising, um, because the larger your node degree becomes, the more payments you can actually route, assuming that the payments come from all the channels and it converges up to like 30,000 payments per second um, over your entire node, because that's like the entire signature computation that you can do. Um, yeah. Um, so then the last question that I was asking is how does this translate to the entire network view and uh, what are the limits of throughput on the network? So, of course, um, just multiplying the number of payments per channel times the number of channels in the network is obviously wrong um, because not all payments are distributed equally across the network. Usually what um, nodes who send a payment do is they try to find a route that is beneficial for them, for example, because it minimizes the routing mm -hmm. fees. So some channels might be more attractive than other channels or some channels are just um, so, uh, connected to good amazing. nodes that uh, route traffic further, right? So the traffic is not equally um, distributed across all channels. Some channels will be used more. So that is usually what computer scientists um, introduce centrality measures for in order to estimate how many payments are expected to go through a node or through a channel. Um, and you could argue that the most central node or the most central channels define an upper bound, bound on what the network can handle, assuming that every node in channel has the same um, throughput uh, requirements. So one, one conjecture that I currently have is, and I haven't simulated this, is once you hit this bound at the channel or the node, this will cascade down because then this channel becomes unusable and then you go through other channels. Um, but I also see reasons why this conjecture might not be true. So again, take this with a little bit of caution. Um, also, centrality measures are a little bit tricky here because, uh, I mean, first of all, they depend on the cost function and various sending nodes could use different cost functions in their route computation. Also, they need to be weighted because um, the likelihood of payment pairs is not the same. While you could infer this from the blockchain data that you see through gossip, um, we, we kind of don't know who pays whom on the Lightning Network. So, while I can make a theoretical observation by looking at centrality measures, 
it's not quite clear um, if I can just apply them stupidly. But it's, again, just following a rough model. Okay, so some definitions. Let X be the number of payments a user wishes to make per year. I use 1,000 payments per year if Bitcoin is being heavily used. I think that's fairly reasonable that you pay people 1,000 times. And N let be the number of network nodes. And for now, I assume one network node per user, right? Um, which is also kind of like a strange assumption because currently what we see on the Lightning Network a lot is custodial, uh, where one node represents various users who each of them might make a thousand payments per year. And then, of course, the expected network-wide payment rate is just multiplying these numbers and um, scaling them to seconds instead of years. Um, so what we, what we can see is for various amounts of users, we have an expected network demand if we assume that each user makes a thousand payments on average. So um, one, one line that I find interesting to focus on for the reminder of the talk is if you assume a million users or a million nodes on the network, what this would mean is that the Lightning Network would have to be able to handle about 32 payments per second on average network-wide. Um, so is this realistic, yes or no? Well, um, as I said before, we have to look at centrality values. So if I look, for example, at the channel's maximum traffic that is possible, which we recall was like about 100 payments, you can divide this by the number of nodes and the average payments per node per second. And recall, this is just the network-wide transactions per second. And the centrality of that channel, or if you do it for a node, the centrality of that node should be lower than this quotient and number. And if that is true, then the network can actually handle the traffic. And of course, this is a heavy oversimplification because as mentioned before, liquidity considerations haven't even been taken into account, right? Because I tried to define like a really upper bound for the stuff. Um, yeah, so what, what we can basically then see is if you again look at the one million users line, um, the maximum possible centrality for a channel could be one. <laughs> Right, because a channel, as we discovered before, can handle 100 payments, but it only needs to handle 32 payments because the centrality of one would mean all the payments go through there. But then if you increase the number of users, the maximum centrality of a channel that can be supported on the network starts to decline with the network-wide demand of the Lightning Network. Right? So we have basically a framework of how we can express what is possible on the network. Um, and I mean, again, take the caution liquidity-based measures we're not taking into consideration. Okay, conclusion from this talk. Um, centrality of a node and a channel yields a bound for the throughput that needs to be supported by the node or by the channel. And custodial services actually increase the network-wide payment demand and allow for less central nodes, right? Because if, let's say, we have a network with one million nodes, but now every node represents 1,000 users, of course, we have more demand on the network and we can not support like that central nodes anymore. But if you go back to the numbers from this article and you assume 4,000 nodes should support 16,000 payments, which obviously only would work if all these nodes are custodial anyway, because 4,000 nodes would never want to make 16,000 payments per, per second. Um, what we can see is that the most central a channel, for example, um, must not have more than 6% of all routing traffic, which would in that case correspond to uh, 100 payments per second. And so, so the answer actually is, is the number that the person derived in this article seems somewhat reasonable under these very strong assumptions, but um, he obviously derived them in, in a very weird way. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other message, of course, is Lightning certainly does not support 40 million payments per second. Um, and, of course, we should not estimate net network traffic by multiplying just the number of nodes and uh, traffic limit per node. Um, and, yeah, I mean, this is obviously a rough upper estimate. So, um, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, of course, you can read the book. And thank you very much for your attention. And I wish you a great lunch. All right, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rene. Uh, just a quick question. How many questions have you answered on the Stack Exchange? I haven't asked many uh, answers. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe three, four hundred, okay. something like that. Yeah. Excellent. Wow. Well, awesome. So yeah, we have time for some uh, few more questions since uh, we're breaking for lunch after this. So uh, if anybody has some questions, please grab the microphones. Uh, there's a microphone there. What can be done to reduce centrality? 
Well, so so the thing is, as if you if you look back at which slide was this? Sorry. So so the question was, what can you do to reduce centrality? What 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 was surprising to me is that centrality is not necessarily a bad thing. Right, I thought so too in the in the beginning because I mean the more central a node is, obviously the more traffic arrives at that node. But what we know from computer science, I mean, usually the node becomes more central if the node degree is higher. But with higher node degree, the node can actually handle more traffic because not all traffic is going to be just through one single channel. Right. So yeah, I was initially trying to find cost functions so that the centrality is being reduced. Um, that didn't work too well. But after I discovered this, I'm kind of like not seeing too much of a problem anymore with nodes becoming very central. Actually, it seems like this is good for the network in, in some sense. Yeah. But, but again, I mean, this is all ongoing research, right? So I mean, this is work in progress. So this is more like discussion and debate and don't take everything too yeah, serious. Uh, so if I understand this right, essentially like the custodial providers having higher payment demand increases the network utilization, like throughput utilization in that area of the graph. But if there are many large custodial providers, then um, I feel like, I mean, this is maybe more of a game theory question. They would start forming um, like external relationships outside the protocol with each other, sort of netting out the balances instead of going through the normal protocol rules. So. Wouldn't that kind of negate some of the benefits of suppressing um, the centrality in those areas of the graph if they started going extra protocol? Um, potentially, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Let's let's keep that discussion maybe out of band. Um, yeah, I feel like that might sort. Of, well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. There's a feel like there's some weird questions that could be answered here. Yes, so, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, sorry, we're recording it, so if you want to use the microphone, or you, you can repeat the question here. Uh, yeah, I had actually uh, two things I was curious about. One was uh, onboarding, which you didn't really mention um, at all. Uh, and I was just wondering if there's a reason for that. Um, but the second question was that you had the 16,000 figure that you uh, initially uh, criticized, and then you were like, eh, hey, whatever. But you were kind of like not very seriously endorsing that, the 16,000 uh, TPS figure. And I was just wondering if, if we just kind of just asked you as an expert to just kind of eyeball the number and just say, like, what do you think the actual number in practice uh, would be, and if we maybe didn't force you to justify it uh, yeah. too carefully. Okay, so thought. so so first of all, the onboarding thing is basically um, tied to liquidity and block space, right? So so I mean, in general, Lightning has um, the issue that it's fundamentally bounded by blockchain uh, block space demand, right? I mean, onboarding is one part of the rule, right? And this is an argument that you fairly often see by concern trolls. But I would argue that the argument is actually worse because to operate a node, you need to do all the swapping and rebalancing all the time. And by the end of the day, this also boils down to on-chain demand, right? So even onboarding doesn't go as well as, as those people right. say, right? So, so it's, it's really tricky, right? So, so that's, that's certainly a problem. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm looking through this at a very specific perspective and at the time of doing this I didn't find this centrality argument so I thought that all of this is actually much worse and I wanted to basically indicate that with these things stuff is actually even worse than we think that they are already with liquidity based questions right so therefore I don't have like a very good and satisfying answer to you because as I said while preparing the slides I, I found this flaw in my argument before um, also, the 16,000 transactions per second on a 4,000 node network seems to me still very high. I mean, from the centrality perspective, yes, that might be true. But with respect to liquidity and the failure rates that we see on the network, 
Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that we can reach that, but it's obviously hard to, to measure this and to know this exactly. So as I said, this is ongoing research, but um, yeah, it's, it's very tricky. Li lightning is complicated. <laughs> Okay, uh, we had time. Uh, so if any other questions, please uh, see Renee after the session. But let's thank, thank him again. So now